Okay, so we're going to cover the efferent division first of the peripheral nervous system, and then we'll talk about the afferent division. Okay, so the efferent division is the link between the central nervous system and your muscles and glands. And those muscles are skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. We're going to subdivide the peripheral nervous division. Oh my gosh. We're going to subdivide the efferent division of the peripheral nervous system into two additional divisions. <laughs> okay? So the efferent branch of the peripheral nervous system is made up of the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system. Okay? Autonomic nervous system is the involuntary branch. Somatic is the voluntary branch. Okay. Autonomic controls cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, exocrine glands, endocrine glands, as well as adipose tissue. Okay. You don't have conscious control of your adipose tissue. It would be super sweet if you did. Right? You'd be like, go away, and it would go away. Okay. Somatic nervous system controls your skeletal muscle. Okay. So we're going to talk about the autonomic branch first. And then we'll talk about the somatic nervous system. Okay. The autonomic nervous system can be further subdivided into two branches. Okay, so we've got the peripheral nervous system. We've got the afferent branch and the efferent branch. The efferent branch is separated into the autonomic branch and the somatic branch. And then the autonomic branch is separated into the sympathetic and parasympathetic. Okay. So the sympathetic is your fight or flight response. So it's preparing your body for strenuous activity. And taking an exam is not strenuous. Okay. Running away from a predator is strenuous. Or getting in a fight is strenuous. Or exercising is strenuous. Okay, sympathetic nervous system also controls the body's response to exercise. But when you get highly anxious right before an exam, you set off your sympathetic nervous system, but you don't have any activity to go along with it. Okay, and so we'll talk about chronic activation of the sympathetic nervous system without physical activity is what leads to all those complications of stress, right? High blood pressure. Hey, parasympathetic nervous system is what you guys all want to dominate during your exam situations, okay? It's your rest and digest system, promotes body maintenance, okay? So most of your visceral organs are innervated by both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, and this is called dual innervation. Okay, and this allows for fine control, right? Because usually they have opposite effects. Okay, so if we think about our heart, what happens to your heart rate when you get scared? It goes up. So that's the sympathetic nervous system. It raises your heart rate. And then what happens to your heart rate when you're just resting? It slows down. Exactly. Okay, so they have antagonistic effects. So it, as we go through the different organs and the effect of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, oftentimes you can just think, well, what happens when I get scared versus what happens when I'm resting, okay? You can use your own body as a cheat sheet, okay? Some of you are weird, though, and I always get questions. Well, why do I pee my pants when I'm scared? <clears throat> okay, so here we've got the brain and the spinal cord. Right? And we have parasympathetic versus sympathetic, and we've got a whole bunch of visceral organs. And notice that most of the visceral organs are receiving input from sympathetic, color-coded green, or from parasympathetic, which are being color-coded purple. Okay? So dual innervation. Most visceral organs are receiving input from both sympathetic and parasympathetic. Okay? We also have highlighted where the nerves controlling parasympathetic versus sympathetic arise from. Okay, so sympathetic arise from the thoracic and lumbar regions of the spinal cord, so the center, and sympathetic arises from cranial and sacral, so the ends. Okay, 
So sympathetic arises from thoracic and lumbar, so central regions. Parasympathetic arises from cranial and sacral regions. Okay, a lot of the sympathetic neurons, synapse, so we've got these ganglions right here. Okay, this is called a sympathetic chain, and it contains a series of ganglions for the sympathetic nervous system. And what's a ganglion? Cell body outside the CNS. Cell body outside the CNS, exactly. So, sympathetic and, nervous, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system are two neuron chains. Okay, they've got a preganglionic neuron that comes from the spinal cord, and then synapses on the ganglion, and then they have a postganglionic neuron that directly innervates the organ. Okay, in the sympathetic nervous system, preganglionic neurons are short, postganglionic are long. In the parasympathetic, preganglionic neurons are long, postganglionic neurons are short. Okay, we'll go over that. And then they tend to have antagonistic effects. So we talked about the heart. Sympathetic ramps it up. Parasympathetic slows it down. Okay, okay there are some exceptions to the dual reciprocate, reciprocal innervation, the dual innervation rule. <coughs> okay. One that's really important that will come into play when we talk about the cardiovascular system is that arterioles and veins receive only sympathetic nerve stimulation. Okay, Your arterioles and veins are innervated by your sympathetic nervous system. The only exception is the arterioles and veins supplying the genitals. Those are innervated by the parasympathetic and sympathetic. Right? And the parasympathetic nervous system causes vasodilation. So that's what leads to erection. Okay? But otherwise, arterioles and veins only innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. Arteries and capillaries aren't innervated at all by either branch. Okay? Arteries and capillaries aren't innervated at all. So they cannot vasodilate or vasoconstrict. They're not innervated. Okay, the pylorectal muscles that make your hair stand on end are only innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. So when you get goosebumps, why do you get goosebumps? Usually for two reasons. One, because it's cold, and so it used to be a lot hairier. Right, so when we got cold, the piloerector muscles would make our hair stand on end and that would trap air and keep us warmer. But most of us don't have enough hair, right, to have that be effective anymore. But it works really well in, say, your dog, right, or your cat. They have a lot more fur. Okay, when do you also get goosebumps? When you're, when you're scared, exactly. Okay, and you also see this in your cat or your dog. Okay, so when they get in a fight, you know, set the hair on the back of their neck stands up. So they're getting goosebumps, except it's making their hair stand up. That's supposed to make them look bigger, okay, to frighten off their opponent. When you get goosebumps, it just makes you look silly, okay. But we haven't lost those piloerector muscles. So our sympathetic nervous system still controls them. Okay, and then our salivary glands are innervated by both branches. Okay. But they don't have antagonistic effects. They just cause different types of saliva to be produced. Okay, So the parasympathetic is going to cause saliva that's full of amylase to get digestion going, whereas the sympathetic often causes more mucus production. And so people who are nervous often get dry mouths because there's not quite enough water in there. Right? But in general, most visceral organs, antagonistic effects. Okay, so I already mentioned the autonomic nervous system is a two-neuron chain, okay? And that two-neuron chain is separated into preganglionic neurons and postganglionic neurons. So at least they're termed something really understandable, okay? The preganglionic neurons occur before the ganglion. The postganglionic neurons occur after the ganglion, okay? So the preganglionic neuron, the cell bodies in the central nervous system, Postganglionic neuron cell body is in the autonomic ganglion. 
Okay, and then the postganglionic neuron is what synapses with the effector organ. So that would be cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, glands, or adipose tissues. Okay, so two neuron chain for both sympathetic and parasympathetic. Okay, this is a nice summary table about differences between sympathetic and parasympathetic. Okay, so being able to recreate this table for study purposes is a great study aid. Okay, so for sympathetic nervous system, the preganglionic neurons come from the thoracic and lumbar regions. Okay, and for parasympathetic, the preganglionic neurons from, come from the cranial and sacral regions. Okay, sympathetic preganglion neurons are short. Parasympathetic preganglionic neurons are long. Okay, sympathetic, you've got long postganglionic neurons because the pre are short. It's opposite in parasympathetic. Short, postganglionic, long, preganglionic. And in fact, a lot of your postganglionic or your, your parasympathetic ganglions occur in the effector organ. Okay, a similarity between sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic is that preganglionic neurons always release acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter. Okay, they are cholinergic. Okay, when I say something is cholinergic, it means it either is releasing acetylcholine or it has receptors for acetylcholine. Okay, so cholinergic means involves acetylcholine. Yep. So you said a, a ganglion is a cell body outside of the central nervous system? Uh huh. So does that mean that preganglionic fibers are separate from the spinal cord? No, no, no. So the preganglionic neurons, their cell bodies are in the central nervous system. They're okay. in the spinal cord or in the cranial region, right? Okay. They just occur before the ganglion, so that's why they're called preganglionic. Okay. Right? Okay. Right. A major difference is the neurotransmitter released by the postganglionic neurons. Okay. For the sympathetic nervous system, postganglionic fibers release noradrenaline, which is also known as norepinephrine. The term adrenaline was trademarked. Okay. So most textbooks use the term epinephrine, okay? And norepinephrine and epinephrine chemically are very similar. They just differ by a methyl group, right? But they are different chemically. Noradrenaline and norepinephrine are chemically identical, just different terms for the exact same chemical, right? The reason why I'm telling you that it's the same thing as noradrenaline is that noradrenaline and adrenaline bind to adrenergic receptors. So they are adrenergic fibers, which if you don't know that adrenaline and epinephrine are synonyms, okay, that adrenergic term doesn't necessarily <coughs> click. Okay, so epinephrine and norepinephrine, same thing. Okay, postganglionic fibers of the parasympathetic nervous system release acetylcholine again. Okay, so parasympathetic nervous system is completely cholinergic. Sympathetic nervous system is preganglionic, is cholinergic, postganglionic is adrenergic. Okay, so here we've got some cartoons showing some of the differences. So this is the sympathetic nervous system. So this would be the thoracic or lumbar region. Okay, so the cell body of the preganglionic neuron would be in the ventral half of the spinal cord, okay, in the gray matter. And then its axon is gonna run out and it's gonna synapse at a autonomic ganglion. And a lot of those synapses occur at the sympathetic chain, okay? And it's gonna synapse on a postganglionic neuron that's then gonna have a axon that runs to the effector organ, okay? And we've got short preganglionic, long postganglionic. The sympathetic nervous system has preganglionic neurons that directly innervate your adrenal glands. And what hormone do you think your adrenal glands release? Adrenaline, which would be also known as epinephrine. 
okay? So your adrenal glands are considered a modified ganglion of your sympathetic nervous system. Okay, the parasympathetic nervous system, preganglionic neurons are gonna arise from the cranial region or sacral region. They're gonna have long preganglionic neurons. They're gonna synapse in autonomic ganglions that are oftentimes in the effector organ and therefore have short postganglionic neurons. Okay. Something that's not being shown on these figures and wasn't in the table, but sometimes it's helpful to think about is one, Preganglionic neuron in the sympathetic nervous system synapses with 10 or more postganglionic neurons, okay, which leads to widespread effects. So for the sympathetic nervous system, you want widespread effects. Okay? When you are in a life or death situation, you want to ramp everything up really fast. Okay? The sympathetic nervous system is for life and death. You want widespread rapid effects. For the parasympathetic nervous system, for rest and digest, you have time. Okay, so you need finer control. So that's why each preganglionic neuron synapses with three or fewer postganglionic neurons. So it makes sense to invest in a lot of architecture for the preganglionic neuron, make it really long, take it all the way to its effector organ. Whereas in the sympathetic nervous system, you want to ramp everything up right away. So instead of investing a lot in a bunch of preganglionic neurons, make those really short, and they turn on a whole bunch of postganglionic neurons all at once. Okay, this figure is showing us neurotransmitters and receptors. Okay, we already discussed the neurotransmitters. So all preganglionic neurons, either in the sympathetic or parasympathetic, are cholinergic. They release acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter, okay, which is being shown in these pinkish circles. Okay, all postganglionic neurons and then chromophin cells in the adrenal gland, which are considered modified postganglionic neurons, have receptors for acetylcholine. And those receptors are called nicotinic cholinergic receptors. So a cholinergic receptor binds to acetylcholine. What else do you think it binds? Nicotine. Okay. These are always excitatory. Anytime acetylcholine gets released by the parasympathetic nervous system or the sympathetic nervous system at the ganglions, okay, the postganglionic neurons fire. Okay, so nicotinic cholinergic receptors are always excitatory. And we have nicotinic cholinergic receptors on our skeletal muscles as well. Okay, the postganglionic neurons in the sympathetic nervous system release norepinephrine, if we're talking about actual neurons, and then the chromophin cells in our adrenal glands release epinephrine into the bloodstream. Okay, and norepinephrine and epinephrine bind to adrenergic receptors because they're also known as adrenaline. Okay. Postganglionic neurons in the parasympathetic nervous system release acetylcholine again. But effector organs of the parasympathetic nervous system have muscarinic cholinergic receptors. And they are sometimes excitatory and sometimes inhibitory. Okay, so sometimes the parasympathetic nervous system excites its effector organ. In the case of bronchoconstriction, okay, it causes smooth muscle lining our bronchioles to constrict. Or sometimes it results in inhibition. So in the pacemaker cells in our heart, it actually slows their action potential, so that heart rate slows. So unlike nicotinic cholinergic receptors that are always excitatory, muscarinic are sometimes excitatory, sometimes inhibitory. And they also bind a compound called muscarine, which is made by poison dart frogs. Okay. So that's where they get their name. Okay, so the adrenal gland is considered a modified ganglion of the sympathetic nervous system. So we have sympathetic preganglionic neurons that synapse in the adrenal medulla. 
Okay, when we talk about the endocrine system, we'll talk about the adrenal cortex, the outer portion, that releases steroid hormones. The medulla, or the inner portion, releases norepinephrine and epinephrine. Only about 20% norepinephrine, 80% epinephrine. Okay, and again, epinephrine is also known as adrenaline. So not only does the sympathetic nervous system innervate directly all of your visceral organs and ramp them up, Okay, it also releases a hormone into the bloodstream that further ramps everything up. Okay, so widespread effects to get fight or flight, life or death situations. Okay, so those receptors, if they bind to acetylcholine, they're called cholinergic. If they bind to epinephrine or norepinephrine, they're called adrenergic. Cholinergic come in two flavors, nicotinic and muscarinic. Okay, nicotinic, always excitatory on all our postganglionic cell bodies in the autonomic nervous system. So both parasympathetic and sympathetic postganglionic cell bodies express nicotinic cholinergic receptors. And then also our skeletal muscles. And they're always excitatory. So anytime they bind acetylcholine, that neuron or muscle cell will fire an action potential as a result. That's what always excitatory means. Muscarinic are on the effector organs of our parasympathetic nervous system, and they can be stimulatory or inhibitory depending on the tissue type, and they gave you two examples. Okay, so unlike nicotinic, they can be inhibitory sometimes. Okay, effector organs of our sympathetic nervous system express adrenergic receptors. Okay, and they come in alpha or beta form. Okay, and then there's subgroups of alpha and subgroups of beta. And the alpha and betas are expressed on different tissues, and they have different affinities for norepinephrine versus epinephrine. Okay, and they might be excitatory or inhibitory. Again, it depends on the tissue type. Okay, so we were talking about receptor types and how receptors that bind to epinephrine or norepinephrine are called adrenergic receptors because another name for epinephrine is adrenaline and another name for norepinephrine is noradrenaline. Okay, so the receptors are still named adrenergic, but they bind to epinephrine and norepinephrine. Okay, and they come in alpha flavor or beta flavor. And then there's two subclasses of alpha, alpha 1 and alpha 2, and three subclasses of beta, beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3. And what this table is showing you is which effector organs have which receptor types. Okay, so different organs that are innervated by the sympathetic nervous system or get blood supply that might have epinephrine in it from the adrenal glands have different subclasses of alpha and beta receptors. And those different receptors have different affinities for norepinephrine, NE, versus epinephrine, EPI. Okay, so the alpha one has a way higher affinity for norepinephrine than for epinephrine. So that means it's much more sensitive to the direct innervation then release of epinephrine from the adrenal glands. Okay. We have not talked about signal transduction at all, so don't worry about that column. Right? And then the effect is excitatory. Okay, so if you excite vascular smooth muscle, that's going to cause vasoconstriction. Okay. If you excite the circular muscles in your pupils, actually no, sorry, that's going to cause vasoconstriction, but the sympathetic nervous system innervates the radial muscles. Okay, made a mistake there. If you excite the radial muscles, that causes pupillary dilation. Okay. Alpha 2 also has excitatory effects. Much higher affinity for norepinephrine versus epinephrine. Okay. And so, again, different types of vascular smooth muscle. This is going to cause vasoconstriction. Okay, it's going to cause the release of fatty acids from your adipose tissue. Because for fight or flight, you want nutrients in the bloodstream for those skeletal muscle to use for fight or flight. 
Okay, the betas is where you start getting differences in affinity. So beta 1 and beta 3 have same affinity for norepinephrine and epinephrine. So they are equally influenced by direct innervation as well as release of epinephrine from the adrenal glands. Okay, and beta 1 and beta 2 are both excitatory. Notice that there's a lot of crossover. Various organs will express multiple types of adrenergic receptors. Let's look at the beta 2 though. Some blood vessels have beta 2, which are much more sensitive to epinephrine versus norepinephrine, and it's inhibitory, okay? The blood vessels supplying your skeletal muscles are oftentimes expressing those beta 2 receptors so that when you start the fight or flight response and everything vasoconstricts, those blood vessels actually vasodilate in response, okay? Because you want blood flow going to your skeletal muscle. If you don't use your skeletal muscle, then they're going to vasoconstrict, okay? But if you start using your skeletal muscle, vasodilation, okay? All right, since we're talking about receptors and different ligands that bind to receptors, remember anything that binds to a receptor is called a ligand. Okay, let's talk a little bit about agonists versus antagonists. Okay, so agonist binds to the same receptor as the neurotransmitter, because we're talking about epinephrine and norepinephrine and acetylcholine, those are all neurotransmitters. Okay, and an agonist for epinephrine or norepinephrine or acetylcholine is going to mimic norepinephrine, epinephrine, or acetylcholine. Okay, it's gonna cause a similar effect. So an agonist acts like the molecule it's mimicking. Okay, it causes the same response. An antagonist binds with the receptor but blocks the neurotransmitter's response. Okay, and let's look at a whole table of some agonists and antagonists. You don't have to memorize these. I'm going to ask you a question where I'm gonna give you the name of some drug. And it might be on this table or it might not be. Okay, and I'm gonna describe how it acts. And then I'm gonna ask you if it's an agonist or antagonist. Right, so you just need to know what an agonist versus antagonist is. You just have to use your critical thinking skills. Okay, and then you have to know sympathetic versus parasympathetic. Because I'll ask you if it's an agonist or antagonist of acetylcholine or norepinephrine. Okay, so let's look at pilocarpine right now. This is a muscarinic agonist. So what kind of receptor does it bind to? Who remembers the muscarinic receptors? Muscarinic, what's the other descriptive term? Muscarinic, not adrenergic, but cholinergic. Okay, muscarinic cholinergic receptors are found on effector organs of the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so if you have a muscarinic agonist, it's going to mimic parasympathetic stimulation. Okay, so someone's given pilocarpine to treat dry mouth. So what do you think pilocarpine causes? Increased salivary excretion, which is an effect of the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, let's look down here at an antagonist. So propranolol is a beta-1 and beta-2 antagonist. Beta-1 and beta-2 are adrenergic receptors. So they're receptors for epinephrine and norepinephrine. People are given propranol to treat ventricular arrhythmias. Okay, so racing heart rate, or not racing heart rate, but irregular heart rate. Okay, so it's going to inhibit the effect of epinephrine or norepinephrine at the SA node. And what does the sympathetic nervous system do to heart rate? ramps it up, exactly, okay? So you wanna block the effect of the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, so some of you might be on some of these drugs, okay? Inhibitors or agonists and antagonists of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system are super common classes of drugs.
Okay, so your brain ultimately controls your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, there is some conscious input from the prefrontal association complex. And that's where your personality resides. So if you think of someone who's high strung, what branch of the autonomic nervous system are they firing more often? If they're anxiety prone, high strung, sympathetic, right? Whereas someone who's really mellow and relaxed are more likely to fire the parasympathetic. Okay, so there is some personality bias into sympathetic versus parasympathetic. Okay, ultimately it's the hypothalamus that's integrating all your autonomic, somatic, and endocrine responses. Remember, it's part of the limbic system. So it coordinates all those responses in response to emotional patterns or behavioral patterns. Okay. You have subconscious control at the medulla within the brainstem. So you've got cardiovascular centers and respiratory centers, both of which are partially to completely control by sympathetic versus parasympathetic. And then you have some autonomic reflexes like urination, defecation, and erection that are housed actually within the spinal cord. Okay, so we have these series of tables that go through the organ systems and say the effect of the parasympathetic versus the sympathetic. And we'll just talk about some of them. We're gonna talk in way more detail about the effect of sympathetic and parasympathetic on the heart and blood vessels when we cover the cardiovascular system, okay? But for the exam about sympathetic versus parasympathetic, what you can think about is that parasympathetic does what to heart rate? Decreases it, and sympathetic does what to heart rate? Increases it. And we'll talk about the exact mechanism when we talk about the cardiovascular system. Okay, when we talk about blood vessels, what I want you to remember is parasympathetic nervous system does not innervate your vascular system, except for the blood vessels supplying the genitals. Okay, but the rest of the vascular system is not innervated by the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system innervates your arterioles and your veins only. Arteries and capillaries are not innervated. Okay. In general, the response to sympathetic stimulation is vasoconstriction, except with skeletal muscle, where they have the beta-2 receptors, where epinephrine will cause vasodilation, okay? So it'll cause vasodilation of your arterioles and vasodilation of your veins. And so that's why if you exercise, you don't see a massive increase in blood pressure. Whereas if you fire your sympathetic nervous system and don't have any exercise associated with it, those arterioles and veins are not gonna vasodilate. So you're gonna have increase in blood pressure. So I bet if I took your blood pressures right before going into the exam, or during the exam, or after the exam, they would be elevated. Okay, lungs. Again, we'll talk more about sympathetic and parasympathetic effect on the lungs when we talk about the respiratory system. What you need to know is parasympathetic nervous system causes bronchoconstriction Sympathetic causes bronchodilation. Okay, and bronchodilation will bring more air in for fight or flight. Bronchoconstriction is when you're resting, you don't need as much oxygen. Okay, for the digestive tract, just think parasympathetic is rest and digest. So anything to do with digestion is going to be ramped up by this parasympathetic nervous system. And then it's going to be inhibited by the sympathetic nervous system. So that is why you often feel sick if you eat a large meal right before you exercise because your sympathetic nervous system is coordinating your body's response to that exercise. One of those things is shutting off GI motility and digestion absorption. So the food just sits there, okay? And it'll give you a stomach ache. Right, the pancreas gets stimulated by the parasympathetic nervous system. And the pancreas releases digestive enzymes into the small intestine. So it makes sense, parasympathetic would stimulate that. And then it releases the hormone insulin. 
And so when you're digesting, you're absorbing glucose and you want insulin to be released as well. Okay, whereas your sympathetic nervous system is shutting down digestion, okay, so it's shutting down the exocrine portion, and it wants glucose to stay in the bloodstream. So it's going to inhibit insulin secretion. Okay, salivary glands, we've got the same activity of parasympathetic and sympathetic where you get saliva production, you just get a different kind. A watery saliva with lots of amylase with parasympathetic, a more mucus, thick saliva with sympathetic. Okay. Kidneys, we'll talk more about renin, so don't really worry about that when we talk about the urinary system. Okay, bladder. Parasympathetic is going to cause your bladder wall to contract and the sphincter holding in the urine to relax. Okay, so parasympathetic helps cause urination, whereas sympathetic relaxes your bladder, has a small effect, okay, but it causes contraction of that sphincter, except in some people who wet their pants when they're scared, okay. Okay, for the male reproductive tract, this is the only time where you have blood vessels innervated by the parasympathetic nervous system. And it causes vasodilation of the blood vessels supplying the penis. So the penis fills or engorges with blood and that's what causes erection. Okay, so parasympathetic causes erection. And then sympathetic is what causes ejaculation. So you have to have coordination between the two. So you need parasympathetic stimulation for erection and then sympathetic stimulation for ejaculation. And so that's why most of the erectile dysfunction drugs are vasodilators. Okay? And sometimes they are abused for athletic performance enhancement Okay, because they cause vasodilation. So if you're wondering why people are doping with Viagra, it's not so that they can get an erection well. <laughs> doing whatever event they're doing, all right? <laughs> it's so that they get vasodilation to their skeletal muscles and their lungs. <laughs> hey, and then for the female reproductive tract, we don't know what the parasympathetic does, okay? And the sympathetic in non-pregnant females causes relaxation, but in pregnant females, it causes contraction. So it plays a role in childbirth. Okay, skin. So skin, we've got sweat glands and piloerector muscles that are innervated by the autonomic nervous system. Both parasympathetic and sympathetic stimulate the secretion of sweat. So that's why you seem to sweat really easily and you don't seem to stop sweating very easily, <laughs> right? Nothing turns it off. Basically, it gets turned on by both parasympathetic and sympathetic and, you know, once it starts, doesn't seem to turn off. Okay, those piloerector muscles that make your hair stand on end on your arms or cause goosebumps are innervated only by the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, the eye, we are going to talk about the role of the sympathetic and parasympathetic in the eye when we talk about vision. Okay, so parasympathetic nervous system causes bronchoconstriction, right, and it also causes contraction of the ciliary muscles so that you can see close objects, right? So parasympathetic causes your pupils to constrict, so less light enters them, right? And that also allows you to see close objects. Sympathetic nervous system causes your pupils to dilate, so you get more light in, Right? And then it also causes relaxation of those ciliary muscles so that you see farther, so that you're not, you know, focusing on near objects. Okay? But you get pupillary constriction and dilation not due to fight or flight. Okay? So the sympathetic nervous system will cause your pupils to dilate in low light situations without firing other portions of the sympathetic nervous system. It's not like your heart rate goes up every time your eyes dilate, okay? Right, your liver is only innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. 
and it causes glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. Who remembers what gluconeogenesis is? Making of new glucose. So glucose of non-carbohydrate precursors. Glycogenolysis is breaking down glycogen. Okay, so the whole point is get more glucose into the bloodstream for fight or flight. Okay, and then adipose tissue, only sympathetic nervous system innervates it. Cause your adipose tissue to release fatty acids. Get nutrients in the bloodstream for fight or flight. If you don't have exercise associated with your fight or flight response, all those nutrients are just going to get packaged back into your adipose tissue. Right? So this is why exercise is good for stress. And maybe a great test taking strategy would be to do some light exercise right before the exam. You know, go out for a nice walk, as long as you normally exercise. Okay, any questions about the autonomic nervous system? Yeah. So could, for this upcoming exam, that stuff, that's going to be on it, right? That's this whole packet. I'll ask you the effects of the parasympathetic and sympathetic on specific organs. Not every single one, but you won't know which one until you get in there. Although, I will tell you, you can just think about what happens when you get nervous and answer the question. You don't get nervous? He's a stone wall. Oh, okay. Maybe you can look at your neighbor and see what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not, I'm, yeah, so I, I might say, you know, what does the sympath, what's the effect of the sympathetic nervous system on heart rate? Or on sweat glands. Or on sweat glands. And also the receptor class. No, don't worry about the receptor class. Just know there are different receptor classes. Yeah. But I won't ask you which receptor class is on specific organs. Okay. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Let's talk about the somatic nervous system then. Okay. So the somatic nervous system is a one neuron chain. Okay. So we've got the cell body of the motor neuron in the ventral horn of the spinal cord, so in the gray manner. And then the axon runs out and directly innervates the effector organ, which is skeletal muscle. Your skeletal muscle is under your conscious control, so it's voluntary. Okay, so your Motor neurons and all the muscle fibers they innervate are called a motor unit. Okay, so a motor unit is the motor neuron. So here we have three motor neurons. Motor neuron one is teal, two is red, and three is purple. And then they've color coded the muscle fibers. So each muscle fiber is the cellular unit of your skeletal muscle. Each muscle fiber is innervated by only one motor neuron. But one motor neuron may innervate multiple muscle fibers. Okay, so here we've got motor neuron one is innervating one, two, three, four, because they color coded them all blue. Whereas motor neuron two, the red one, is only innervating three muscle fibers, and the purple one, number three, is only innervating three. Okay. The area where the motor neuron innervates the muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction. Okay, so we have the axon terminal of the motor neuron, and it's filled with synaptic vesicles that are filled with the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Okay, so motor neurons use acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter. And then we have this area of the plasma membrane, which is actually called the sarcolemma, in skeletal muscles, right, where we have these ridges, and this is called the motor end plate, okay, and the motor end plate has a bunch of nicotinic cholinergic receptors on it, okay, and so when acetylcholine gets released by the motor neuron, it binds to those nicotinic cholinergic receptors, and they're always excitatory. So every time the motor neuron fires and releases acetylcholine, Skeletal muscle contracts in response. Right, so here we have a step diagram. Step number one, action potential reaches the axon terminal. 
That opens voltage-gated calcium channels on the axon terminal. Calcium rushes in, which causes exocytosis of the neurotransmitter, which should sound really familiar. Right? We already talked about this with neurons in general. Okay? The neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is water-soluble, so it diffuses across what's called the neuromuscular junction, which I already said, okay, and then binds to nicotinic cholinergic receptors. Nicotinic cholinergic receptors are nonspecific cation channels. Okay, so they let both sodium and potassium through. But sodium's electrochemical gradient is much greater to enter the cell than potassium's to leave. So way more sodium enters the cell. That depolarizes the skeletal muscle. It fires an action potential. Your muscle contracts. Okay? Then that acetylcholine has to be removed from the synapse. And it's removed by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, which is on the motor end plate as well. Okay, and then that choline, the acetyl group dis diffuses away. The choline gets reabsorbed by the motor neuron, and it's going to be reformed into acetylcholine, repackaged into synaptic vesicles. Okay? Motor neuron can fire again. Nerve impulses, also known as action potentials, travel from the brain or spinal cord to trigger the contraction of skeletal muscles. An action potential propagates down a motor neuron to a skeletal muscle fiber. The site where a motor neuron excites a skeletal muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction. This junction is a chemical synapse consisting of the points of contact between the axon terminals of a motor neuron and the motor end plate of a skeletal muscle fiber. The events at the neuromuscular junction occur in seven coordinated steps. Step 1. An action potential travels the length of the axon of a motor neuron to an axon terminal. Step 2. Voltage-gated calcium channels open and calcium ions diffuse into the terminal. Step 3. Calcium entry causes synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine via exocytosis. Step 4. Acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to acetylcholine receptors, which contain ligand-gated cation channels. Step 5. These ligand-gated cation channels open. Step 6. Sodium ions, shown here in red, enter the muscle fiber, and potassium ions, shown here in blue, exit the muscle fiber. The greater inward flux of sodium ions relative to the outward flux of potassium ions causes the membrane potential to become less negative. Step 7. Once the membrane potential reaches a threshold value, an action potential propagates along the sarcolemma. Neural transmission to a muscle fiber ceases when acetylcholine is removed from the synaptic cleft. This removal occurs in two ways. 1. Acetylcholine diffuses away from the synapse. 2. Acetylcholine is broken down by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase to acetic acid and choline. Choline is then transported into the axon terminal for the resynthesis of acetylcholine.
All right, so the neuromuscular junction is super well studied. Did you have a question? No, so in skeletal muscle, every muscle fiber has to be innervated. And sometimes that motor neurons can get pulled away from the muscle fibers, and that's what they think they cause is muscle, um, lowered muscle strength as you age. So as you age, some of those motor neurons get dislodged, right? And if they're not innervated, they're not going to function. Okay. Cardiac muscle acts differently, though. And we'll talk about that when we talk about cardiovascular physiology. Yeah. Do they know what causes those junctions to release? To dislodge? Yeah, just use. Wear and tear. Yep. Aging. <coughs> yep. Okay. So the neuromuscular junction is super well studied because it occurs outside of the central nervous system. Right? So we can mess around with it. There's no blood-brain barrier affecting drugs and the neuromuscular junction. Okay, so the video mentioned acetylcholine esterase, which is the enzyme, and it showed it floating in the neuromuscular junction. It doesn't float. It's actually on the motor end plate. Okay, it's adhered to the motor end plate. And it inactivates acetylcholine, right? And it is susceptible to chemical agents and various diseases. Okay, so one thing that affects acetylcholine esterase, right, or the neuromuscular junction in general is black widow spider venom. Okay, we have black widows in Utah, so they don't bite very frequently. Okay, and that causes an explosive release of acetylcholine which is a problem for your diaphragm, right? So you'll contract your diaphragm one last time, and then it'll stay contracted, okay? So you'll take one last breath, basically. Okay, botulism toxin, which you get from dented cans, right? You're never supposed to eat food out of dented cans or cans that have bulges on them or food that's been in the garbage, right? You guys don't eat garbage food, right? It blocks the release of acetylcholine. But this is what Botox injections are doing. Okay, so Botox injections are the botulism toxin that they're injecting into your forehead muscles. Although you guys are all so young, you don't need Botox yet. Okay, so that decreases wrinkles because wrinkles are continued contraction of the forehead muscles. Okay, curare, which is in poison dart frogs, blocks the action of acetylcholine. So it is an antagonist, right? Organophosphates act on acetylcholine esterase, so acetylcholine doesn't get inactivated. So again, you're going to have one last contraction of your diaphragm. And those organophosphates are um, used in pesticides. So that's why someone who's spraying pesticides wears a respirator. Okay, and then the disease myasthenia gravis inactivates the acetylcholine receptor sites. Okay, so you don't respond to acetylcholine being released. So have issues with muscle contraction. Yeah? Not to sound weird. Isn't that with nerve gases? So that myasthenia gravis is a disease. Oh, okay. I, I yeah. Because I... So nerve gases would act similar to organophosphates. Okay. Yep. Because I, I thought that their muscles, like from World War I, their muscles would just keep contracting and never release. So, no, myasthenia gravis is a, um, is a disease where you get slow inactivation of those acetylcholine receptor sites. So your motor neurons are functioning fine. Your skeletal muscles just don't respond. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any questions about the somatic nervous system? We'll talk way more detail about skeletal muscle contraction in a week or so.